Hello, hello, we're live. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hey, hey. Hi, hi. Hey, hey. I like that. Uh, <laughs> and hello, everyone who's attending this webinar. Thank you for being here. Uh, we, we were told there's there's a lot of you apparently out there right now. So um, say hi as well. Um, so I wanted to start today's webinar by saying we're going to talk about uh, Google Mom and what it means for search. Um, it's been around for a little while, although we, we expect it to start impacting more and more what we see in search. And to discuss that, I have to uh, great if I say so, SEO experts with me today. I have Crystal Carter, who's the head of SEO communications at Wix. Hi, Crystal. Hello. And I also have Mike King, who's the, uh, the founder and CEO at IPOL Rank. Greetings and salutations. <laughs> and um, we, we are going to discuss as much as we can uh, what mum means, what it means for search, what it means for SEO, what it means for people doing content, what it means for you, whether you're a user or you have a business and, and you know, online is, is one of your main channels of, of getting your business out there. Um, and why we do that? Because mum has the potential to drastically change what we see in the SERPs, right? How actually this whole experience translates um, going into the future. Uh, apparently it's already started slightly, but it's, it's going to impact more and more what we see. So, um, that's that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I think I want to start with with Crystal. Uh, both both our guests have prepared some some pretty cool slides, and they have a lot to talk to you about. So I'm going to pass to Crystal uh, to talk to us about Mum. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm really pleased to be here with both of you, um, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion. I am the head of SEO communications at Wix, and today I'm going to be talking about Google Mom in a sort of a sort of top level, a sort of introductory, just get your head around it sort of way. Um, without saying too, giving too much away, Mike's going to get into the to a lot of the details. So, so if you're looking for deets, more and more details, um, Mike will get to that um, when we when we get there. Um, so, I'm just going to um, start off with just a sort of warm up around sort of some of the co core concepts um, that are really important for for SEOs and um, and other users to understand when we're thinking about thinking about Google Mom um, in a wider context. So, if I am able to share my slides. Fantastic. Okay, thank you. Um, so making sense of Google's mom. <laughs> so Google mom is an algorithm. Um, and what is a Google algorithm update? These are this is what they what they do when they update uh, algorithms. So they're adding a new algorithm to to the mix. So when they update their algorithms, sometimes we refer to it as a core algorithm update. Um, sometimes it can be something that's a little bit smaller, but every time they make a change, um, what they're doing is they're essentially refining um, how they are understanding and conveying information to the world. So when they update their algorithm, they are they are changing the criteria or directive that they use to um, to order information on the web and to to help their users best find what they need. And to do this, um, yeah, they have to adjust periodically which information that they deem to be most important. And sometimes this can have a big effect on which, which results we see on the web. Now, when we think about this, it's important to think about how search works. And if you look at Google, they explain that their mission is to organize the information to make it most universally acceptable and useful. And they say it starts with search. But what you'll notice is they haven't said anything about websites. And I haven't said anything about websites, and that's because they don't either. And that's because their goal is to organize information in the best way possible. So when they're doing their algorithm updates, they are doing this to make sure that the, uh, the information that they're supplying is, is of the best quality. And sometimes this can be information that comes from that comes from websites. A lot of times it comes from websites, but sometimes like for instance, if you go on go on to search on your mobile, you'll see a lot of the information will come from apps or you'll see that sometimes it'll just be a video straight to a video, or it might be that they've got it showing in Google Maps. Um, this, is, this is what they need to do to make sure that the information that they're giving to people is accurate and is useful and, um, and is most helpful. So you'll see that over the history of their algorithm updates, it, it, it used to be that there were sort of few core updates um, happening happening over time. And, but you can see that as we get further along, as we start seeing more machine learning, 
getting involved. And as we see more, uh, more, uh, more algorithm, uh, more algorithms being added to the mix, the updates become more thick and fast. So in, in 2018, for instance, there were over 3000 updates happening. Um, and I think that the, as we see Google Mom rolled out, um, that we're likely to see more of that. And one of the reasons why is because things are becoming a lot more complex. So Google has to make these updates in order to keep up with how users are, are using the web, how we're accessing information, the kind of information that we expect to see, and um, and and how that impacts search. So what Google, so if we think about way back in the day when we had sort of 10 plain blue links, people would think about, you know, what information was available. But now Google has to account for where the person is searching, when they're searching, what time of day they're searching, um, how they're searching if they're on a mobile or if they're on a screenless, screen-free device, um, you know, hey Alexa, hey Google, um, or, or, you know, who's searching. So they have lots and lots of information about who is doing the search. And they use all of this to, to, uh, to direct their, their algorithms. So for instance, if you look at a, a search for kids' clothes in 2017 versus a, a search for kids' clothes in 2022, there's a lot more information that talks about about where or that gives information about um, you know where the person is searching from, gives reviews on the quality of, of it, of it takes into account you know when the search is being made, and and is giving lots of different information. So Google Google is trying to make sure that when they're supplying information, that they're moving ever closer to making the information highly accessible from the best possible sources and the most useful. When we look at their their algorithm updates, we can see that they tend to be split into similar similar uh, categories. So, the mobile first, the page experience, the um, page speed insight, and int intrusive interstitials, and a lot of their core updates will think about accessibility. And I mean accessibility with a small a. <laughs> um, so just about people actually being able to to get onto a website. Um, and then it, from the best sources was when we think about things like the spam updates or product reviews updates, site diversity updates. Those are making sure that we've got good quality quality information and the most useful. Things like um, passage ranking, for things that are very, very much associated with um, with EAT. So, what does that have to do with with Mum? Right? What what am I on about? Well, Mum is the latest in Google's suite of super powerful algorithms. So, it runs alongside BERT, but it's much more powerful than BERT. And again, Mike is going to get into all the details around that. But MUM stands for Multitask Unified um, Model. And not only does it process natural language, but it does so in many, many, many languages. Um, and it's continuing to add them as we go along. It also processes text and images with a similar sort of quality and is moving closer to, to being able to do the same with, with um, you know, other types of media as well. And that's because this is cons Google calls this their, a new milestone in their understanding of information. This is also um, part of the, the sort of uh, natural shift in focus that comes as part of the sort of mobile first digital experience, which allows users to engage in content dynamically, both uh, through inputs and outputs. So, you know, users are logging into Google and they're adding reviews directly into Google. Um, users are adding photos directly into Google. Users are getting photos from Google. This is a very two-way two conversation and, and Google Mom and Google's algorithms are trying to keep up with that. So this is this is what they're trying to trying to push towards this. And they're trying to make sure that, that we are understanding or that they're able to understand the um, the information uh, with with uh, with good and fresh eyes. So let's consider when we think about what what mum looks like. Um, let's have a look at uh, mum's spaghetti squash. Um, so if we think about how how information is is ordered um, on on Google uh, um, in this sort of multimodal uh, space. We're looking at information that we're getting a lot of a lot of different um, inputs from. So not only are we finding, you know, the the information about what the spaghetti squash is, what it looks like, um, different recipes, things like that. We're also starting to get more of a breakdown with trying to trying to understand the intent around it. So, um, so spaghetti squash is a very sort of you know that's a two two level two word query. So it's very light. Um, but you can get into, but they're giving us more information there. So, so they're they're trying to understand intent. They're trying to understand lots of different ways that we're thinking about this information. So, not only this spaghetti squash, but what's a substitute for a spaghetti squash? You could substitute it for zucchini. Um, they also want to, to want to think about different ways that you might understand it um, using different media and video in particular seems to be seems to be something that, that that they're quite heavy on. So, on this particular one, you see you can see um, information for videos here. 
You can see information for videos here. Um, and you can also see um, see further information when you're getting into, into those details. And this is because Google wants to make sure that you've got that you've got the most information um, uh, possible for for for, uh, for the query that you need. And that it's not just from text, it's not just from videos, but it's from a mix of information. So what can we expect from them in the short term? I think that we're probably going to see a lot more um, more algorithm updates over time. Um, but that the good thing about that is that there's less corrective time because <laughs> they'll just correct it straight away. Um, the other good thing, uh, the other thing we're likely to see in the short term is more images um, uh, and, and, and more more better understanding for image heavy verticals. If you're a photography site, if you're um, if you're a video site or things like that, this will be good for you. Um, another thing is it's great for it's great for user experience because it's a much richer experience. Um, in the in the long term, I think that there's there could potentially be some vert some some volatility around um, around uh, different verticals like the health verticals because I know that Google has actively talked about getting into health verticals using some of their image image optimization understanding. Um, there could also be um, some reduction in the prominence of English content because they're getting so much so much more invested into um, into international content. And we could also see um, more more device driven um, driven updates from from things like Google Lens, um, uh, which has been a big part part of the mum the mum conversation. There's lots of other things that we think we we might see, but I want to make sure that we've got time to get to um, Mike's fantastic slides. Um, so um, that's that's a wrap for me. Um. Amazing. Uh, Crystal, thank you so much. You didn't have to rush. We have enough time. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Um, well, me hosting this for the first time means that I forgot to say to everyone and encourage everyone to ask your questions in the chat. Uh, we, we are going to get to them uh, after our discussion here, and we're going to, to aim to answer as many of them as possible. I would also like to give a special shout out to Rich, who noticed my uh, mom's spaghetti joke, which I spent <laughs> a lot of time investing in. <laughs> Wonderful joke. <laughs> I mean, you only get one shot to make a joke like that. <laughs> nice, nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yes, please, please send us your questions, ask your questions. And, and as we go along, we're, we're going to uh, take them into account in our discussion and then cover them as well at the end. Um, so Crystal, that that was great. Uh, that was that was incredible in terms of of giving us a great context around not just how Google works, but how Mom brings some some new angles into this, and uh, how you ended your presentation just just reminded me how uh, Google almost a year ago now I think announced Mom saying, "I think we've lost Mike." Uh, <laughs> we're gonna carry. He's gonna join us. Right. Um, announcing that. First of all, it can not just understand language, but generate it. Um, yeah. Second, that it works across <laughs> five languages, um, which, languages. yeah, which which has the potential to change a lot in how people in different locations and using even different languages can can consume content that was not accessible to them previously. Um, so, um, so, yeah. how do I you think see that affecting? Uh, I I think that that can be really good for for making making um, marketers who are who who are maybe working in in um, in in a region that's smaller um, or has a smaller population um, connect with connect with bigger audiences. I think it also um, and I think it's also going to make make so, like English like so. I think the internet is you know ha there's a lot of, of English preference in 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 the internet. Yeah. But I think that that you know I think English content pre creators are going to have to step up their game because I think that that certainly even uh, even as I see on Twitter for instance I follow a few people who speak languages that I do not but they're but they're they're a translation the translations um, that they have on Twitter are actually really really good and and there's yeah. so much AI translation that's going on right now that I think that's just going to continue at a pace so so I think that that you know if you're making content and you're just relying on your English content I think you that that now is the time to make Make sure that you've got you know language you know language covered like multiple languages covered uh, across across your core content um, uh, categories. That's interesting because I've I've been thinking well not being a, a native English speaker myself so usually I I tend to search uh, I'm in the UK so see the results here and just just because of what we do you know I just check the same thing in in Greek uh, SERPs <laughs> just to see it's a much smaller market so sometimes mm. it's. It's great to see the differences. And regarding the languages, I was thinking, could it also mean 
the opposite. Like, you know, there's there's a lot of companies that stretch their resources and budgets too thin sometimes trying to to create a lot of local content and localize pretty much the same thing sometimes uh, for different markets. Could it have the opposite effect? Like, you know, focus on a language, do a great job there and, and gradually um, mom will catch up. I think I think that that's that's a potential. I think I think also I think Google Google when they're talking when they, they gave the example and I think I think you mentioned this in your slides, Mike, about Mount Fuji, and they talk about having some some local information there that a local person will be able to provide a particular amount of local information. Um, uh, and so so I so I think that that they'll probably bring that into their algorithm when they're thinking about like EAT, for instance. So mm -hmm. expertise. So so obviously somebody who is from the place will have more expert knowledge than someone who is not from a place. If they're talking about like say I don't know where to go for dinner um, in New York. Like if you live in New York, you will know better than me googling from the UK about you know whether or not there's a good pizza place. So um, so so I think that I think that that. I think that it should balance out between mm -hmm. between um, you know the expertise points, the local pack points, and things like and and things like um, and, and and things like over, overall expertise and, and content content quality. So I think mm -hmm. I think it can I think it can be a big a bit of a mix. But so it can be an opportunity actually for let's say the small guys, right, or or the local guys who previously maybe could not even compete, right? Yeah, I think if you're talking about something something really niche, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mike, what do you think? I think I couldn't find my mute button. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, you know, for the most part, uh, a lot of this stuff is going to come from, you know, the, the same sites that you're seeing rank quite well for broad terms, right? Like, I think Google thinks of sites like Wikipedia, WebMD, and so on is like inherently authoritative. And so when they want to answer a quick question, they're very much going to leverage those. But like Crystal is saying, when it becomes a more uh, niche uh, topic or subject where, you know, those sites can't answer those questions in that way, they are going to start to drill down there. However, I think that what we're talking about with mom is that, you know, they're putting multiple pieces of information together to give you a response. Like in the example that they gave you, they're talking about, okay, you know, I want to climb Mount Fuji after I've climbed another mark, uh, mountain they're pulling a variety of pieces of information from different sources and then generating a new piece of text based on that so it's not necessarily just about like how do i myself make myself rank better so i'm the answer um this these series of algorithms are generating answers so it's not just about like how do i be there it's like how do i be a part of it and so it may not necessarily be that like your brand is like this brand says here's the answer no google is is taking a series of facts that it's finding and then saying here's the answer so you may not have the opportunity to truly have that visibility through this type of um algorithm update mm -hmm. thank you and and that that also kind of um to me it, it rings a, an alarm when thinking about passage ranking as well and, and sort of how Google can now um, bring that into it. Cause, cause it does sound like it. you're, you're right, Mike, that it's no longer about here's 10 or even five and a featured snippet or whatever it might be. Click on something. If you want to find out more, it's more about serving that intent and need on those pages and answer it without having to work too hard for it essentially. Right. Exactly. And I think what the opportunity is, is like you being that complete answer so that mom doesn't have to do such a hard, hard job of it. Right. Because that's that's the whole point. Like they don't want to give you 10 options. They want to give you the answer and they don't want to just answer. They don't they don't want to just give you the answer. They want to give you your answer to your specific question. And historically, that's when Google has done is giving you the answer. And then you have to go through several times to determine what is the answer so you can compute your answer. And so they're trying to get there for you uh, and give you that domain expertise and answer to your queries. Yeah. Wait. So an example of the spaghetti squash, they, they like the spaghetti squash can be hard to find in a supermarket. So you notice that the first thing on there was a substitute. 
for spaghetti squash <laughs> because if you're if you're googling this you probably don't know what you don't know what it is that's why you've googled it um and you probably need a replacement and what is a replacement it's a it's a zucchini and they've just pulled that information from 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 that um and it behaves very similarly to featured snippets and 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 featured the featured snippets and the um the um the instancers behave very similarly so they pull the text from it, sometimes from the middle of the page, sometimes from different parts of the page, um, and and so they're using a very similar similar technique when the, when they're do, when they're doing this um, to make sure that they're answering they're they're predicting your your answer, um, and and they're giving it to you um, uh, in in that way. Yeah, which is which is mind blowing. I was having a discussion with uh, Morty Morty Oberstein uh, a while back about it because it's like even as a human being. It is hard to understand what someone may need, even if you know them, if they ask in a very general way, like, are they having a bad day? Are, are they ashamed to ask for some? Do they not even know what they want? They, they have a vague idea. So to think that we are now at a stage that we're discussing a search engine kind of catering for so many, not just obvious intents, but implied intents that vary based on your personal search history, location, all of that is... Um, it's mind blowing, uh, and across seventy five languages, I will never stop saying that. So, <laughs> I know we have we could discuss forever, but I want to make sure Mike also gets a chance to to go over his slides. So, I'll stop us here. Please keep posting your questions. We see them. We have them in our queue to answer as well and cover. Um, and Mike, please just um, talk to us about your slide. Cool. So Chris will talk me up now. I have to actually be good. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give it a shot. So, so I'm sharing my screen. If we could bring that up, that'd be perfect. So I just want to give you a, a brief technical overview on how mum works. And my apologies for the background noise. I share an office with Google. So you're hearing from Google right now, um, meaning my wife. Um, so first I'm Mike King. I'm from an agency called I4 rank. We are based here in uh, New York city. And we do everything related to SEO, content strategy, and machine learning. I also make music, and you can download my music right here. Also, I have a new video that I put out. You can check that out as well if you want more entertainment from me when I'm not right in front of you. Okay, so how does how does mom work? Well, um, you know, I really feel like Google is trying to build the Star Trek computer. And back when Amit Singhal ran. Uh, Google search. He was like the SVP of Google search for a number of years. Uh, he was saying that he was like, I want to build the Star Trek computer where you just have that ambient computer around you where you can ask questions at any point. And so what you're you're seeing with mom and when they introduced it, they talked about this idea of being able to, you know, answer very complex questions. And again, we talked a little bit about that Mount Fuji question and, and how it requires someone with domain expertise to ultimately answer that for you. But the thing is, Google has dramatically improved its ability to both understand and generate language over the last few years. And so this was called transformer tech and technology, which is one of the underlying uh, components of how BERT works. The T in BERT stands for transformers. And transformer technology is also behind a lot of the leading language models out there. If you've heard of GPT-3, it is based on this concept. And effectively, the way it works is they train it on a big data set of pages from across the uh, web, of course. And um, what they do is they'll extract different words, and then they build these models to predict what the next word would be. And so based on that, they can then write copy in a way that you and I can't tell the difference of whether or not a, a person wrote it versus whether uh, a computer wrote it. And so they're able to leverage this information or this, this capability in building algorithms moving forward. So their understanding of language is just far beyond what it's been, you know, as long as I've done SEO, basically. And so the multitask unified model is something that they say is a thousand times better than BERT. And it's built on one of their other language models, which is called T5, where it's a text to text transformation transformer. I think it's what it's called. And it's the most ridiculous name ever. But nevertheless, um, you know, it, it really allows them to understand the copy a bit better, understand your wow. queries a bit better, and also generate answers from a variety of different data points that it can pull across this index. And so if you read this one paper that they have, it's called Rethinking Search, Making Domain Experts Out of Dilettantes. They talk a lot about what the goals are 
for just search in general and also what they're doing here with mom. And so what they talk about is this idea of that, you know, search engines historically just give you facts. They just help you get to a series of answers as fast as possible, but they don't necessarily always fulfill a specific need. If you ask a question that's too complicated to Google historically, it's just gonna give you a list of, you know, related stuff, but it's not necessarily gonna answer your question. And so ultimately what they're trying to do is again, just pull pieces of the web together, synthesize it, and then generate an answer from new text based on the information that they pull. So technically, what does mum do? Well, it's multimodal, which means you can use a variety of different ways of asking your question, whether that's using images, videos, audio, or just standard queries. And it also allows for more complex queries because of their ability to just better understand what you're asking for. And again, we're talking about this idea that it's able to connect in 75 different languages. So it's able to translate stuff that otherwise isn't in the given language or the searcher's language and then still give them an answer despite the fact that that, that information is in another language. So a couple things here. Multimodal search is actually not new. And multimodal search isn't just, you know, how do I explicitly search, whether that's with a video, whether it was that's me like just, you know, humming a song and seeing if the if google can figure it out it's also taking into context your context so where are you physically or did you have a series of searches leading up to this search what can i learn from that to then inform how i answer this search so as an example you know if i'm saying how far is the empire state building well for me like i can see it from my window and it's like five miles away or whatever uh, whereas anyone else on this call, it's going to be across the Atlantic Ocean and it's going to be, you know, a much farther place. So I can say, you know, where's the Empire State Building into Google Home? And then I can also ask as a, as a subsequent query, uh, how long will it take me to get there? And so implicitly, Google is able to know, like physically, I am in downtown Brooklyn. That's in Midtown. These are two points. I can now, you know, answer the question as to how far it is based on the information that, that's implicitly there. And also the pronoun is already understood from my previous search. So these are all ideas of, of multimodal search. And in fact, if you've ever done a, an image search where you've put a query in, you are also doing multimodal search. It's not just, um, you know, the, these new ideas that we're talking about. It's something that's been a part of how Google works for a long time. And so typically, if you perform a search that's similar to that, you know, where you have the query in there, the, the word query, and you also have the image, both of those things are broken down into their atomic components and then used to determine you know, what is it that we should be considering in our in our set of pages that we want to review? And so as you're seeing on this screen, you know, imagine I'm searching for this room scene. It's then broken down into a chair, another chair, a table, uh, a potted plant. So then those are all part of the query, because part of what mom does is it converts anything that you're searching, no matter how you search it into text. And um, <laughs> Also, it uses the text to then uh, improve or further uh, contextualize those rankings as well, but also taking that user context into account. And so this is what that would look like. You know, the multimodal query can come from any type. Again, that, that personal context, which can be the implicit query, the actual keyword that they've given, an image that they've up uploaded. And those are all run through different scoring functions or algorithms. And then whatever the outcomes are from that, they're then you know, reviewed together and then sifted down to what ultimately should be the series of results that you want. But with mom, they're trying to get to one result. And so again, they may take features from all of these different things that they're pulling out and then writing an actual response for you. So Google has actually modeled users for forever, basically. They've well, not forever, for a long time, where they've collected your search queries and they, again, collected your the information about where you're searching from and use all that information to build that user context to inform personalization. So it's not just, you know, um, this being something new, it's also a function of um, there being, you know, just a long history of Google having a lot of data on you that they leverage for these things as well.
And so this is what that looks like. You know, they're, they're collecting everything in their query logs. And there's a lot of information that goes with those query logs, including, you know, the location, including uh, what did you end up clicking on? And all those things inform what they're going to show you in the future. So multi-model is also not new. So when we talk about MUM, they're talking about, you know, they co they take your query, they're running it through a variety of different models at the same time, depending on what you've given them. And then again, there is ultimately an output. And so some, some very interesting things that they highlight here. One, the inspiration for multi-model, and multi-model was something that they talked about, they rolled out in 2017. So again, this isn't like brand new stuff. But what they say is that, uh, it's it's informed or it's inspired by how the human brain works. So matter no matter how or which of your senses you pull in information about or through, you're reconciling that information into one thing, whether that's words or thoughts or however you think. If you're someone that doesn't have an internal monologue, you just see pictures, cool, whatever it is. They're, they're saying like we pull everything in and then we turn it into words and then there's an output that is a series of words as well. And again, this is how T5 itself works. Like before we even think about mom, if you use T5, it has a series of different operations that it can do. It can do translation. It can uh, it can score a sentence for grammar. It can also, uh, you know, uh, come up with text summarization. And this one model encapsulates a series of models. You throw in text, it gives you text back. So another really interesting thing that they identify with the multi-model concept is that when you start to mix models together, they, they're not even sure why, but it, it um, ultimately gives you better responses. And so I think what they're doing with uh, mom is they're just kind of like playing around with that to get the right um, combination of models to use in order to generate the right response. So the mom patent, this one is out there. I recommend you just take a look if you're more interested in how things work. But the bottom line is what it talks about is it, it uses image recognition, speak recognition, translation, image capturing, and then also parsing in general to get to the bottom of whatever someone is trying to answer with their query. And so another thing to know about how Google understands queries is they break them down into entities. So entities have been something that we've talked about in SEO for a long time. Um, but here's a good example that they've shared in the past where they the query is, who was the US president when the Angels won the World Series? And so that's a series of different entities that they break that down into. And then they can use that information associated with those entities to better answer those questions. So as you can see here, you know, this is broken down to a list of presidents, a country, baseball team, World Series winners by year. And so they can start to bring those features in and then narrow that down to the answer, which is George W. Bush. Mom also has a great understanding of entities. And so again, this is that example that they gave us about Mount, Mount Adams versus Mount Fuji. And so what's highlighted in blue are the specific entities. And so there's a lot of implicit queries that are being asked as part of this ex explicit question. And some of those involve what is uh, fitness training required for the terrain? What hiking gear is, is required for fall weather based on when the person said that they wanna do that. And so effectively, it's asking all those questions in the background and then pulling all that information together and stitching together an answer to that query. And so here's an example of, you know, here's a series of facts that it may be pulling together again to then answer that question more comprehensively. So what's really interesting is that Google has continued, of course, because you know they innovate every day, but they have something else coming out called Mural, or they, they've announced it um, at the end of last year, which kind of does this at more depth for imagery. And so uh, if you ask a question related to a series of, of images, they're able to look at an image, even though if it's not in English, excuse me, or not in the, the language that you asked it in, and say, okay, well, we know this means the same thing, even though it's in Japanese or even though it's in Spanish or Greek or whatever. And so they're able to still extract information from that to answer your question, which isn't something that I'm aware they were able to do in the past. So what I believe is that we're seeing the building blocks of that Star Trek computer. And over the course of the next five to 10 years, I'm, I'm expecting things like Google Home, Google Assistant to be far more intuitive, far more reactive in ways that they're not saying, hey, I can't answer that question. They're just able to derive 
far more information from your implicit and explicit context. And again, Google wants to answer your question instead of just the question. And yeah, we're in the future. Wrapping up. I'm Mike King. I'm not the real estate agent for that house. Um, <laughs> we also have something called the SEO Weekly that my guy Garrett does. He's out on, on paternity leave, but he'll be back soon. I encourage you to tune in. And yeah, you know how to find me on the internet. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you. That that was incredible. Thank you so much. Um, right. I've made so many notes and we have so many questions um, that I want to start um, basically with something that we were discussing slightly before, uh, but I see is also a question uh, that we have in the chat so it, it can get things started. So my question initially was, are SEOs ready for mom? Let's start at a simple place. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I think if you've, I think if you've been doing, if you've been uh, making good content, as they as they always say, um, for for a while, then then you should be fairly ready for mum. If you have been making good content that is also that also has a very rich um, sense of multimedia, then you will be more ready for mum. So so again, it is pulling from lots of different sources. So. Google's putting so much so much video on on um, onto the SERP at the moment. That's 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 one way. The Google Images. There's not only um, the sort of you know Google Google Images regular thing, but there's also there's also you know the topic layer within Google Images. Um, if you're invested in if you're spending some time investing in semantic search, um, which is a really really um, interesting and, and uh, fast developing um, section of, of SEO. Um, then, then you'll be more prepared um, for for um, for Google Mom. And I think also if you're and if you're a smaller business and you um you maybe don't have all the resources to like be running like machine learning models all the time and that sort of thing, then you can use some of, you can use some other tools. So, for instance, if you're using things like um, like Google's like like. Um, Google business profile, not Google my business, Google, Google business profiles, for instance, that they will encourage you to, to add, um, to be on Google Maps, to have images, to have, to have video, to have lots of different information, to be able to answer questions within um, a Google business profile. Um, and they have lots of other other ways that, that there's lots of other Google products that you can engage in that that encourage you and sort of guide you through some of those those sort of um, making content in a in a sort of multimodal way. Mm -hmm. And Mike, what do you think? Um, is the SEO yeah. community ready for it? Uh, is the SEO community ever ready for anything? <laughs> <laughs> I I think. You know, the one thing to know is that they are training on this, all this stuff on the web as it stands. So that's an indication that, you know, it's going to work irrespective of whatever we do. But I think uh, Crystal's earlier points about how do we uh, use more structured data? How do we just continue to, you know, make content that's more specific is how you can account for this. But I don't think it's the type of thing where it's like, hey, here's a punch list of things of how you optimize for mom. I don't think that's necessarily realistic it's really about like how do we have the content that meets the specific context of the users that you know we're trying to reach and so it's, it may require that you know you have more robust content or you have uh, different pieces of content that cover the same thing that are more relative to a given audience because we're, we're going to find is this kind of acts like a more of a filter bubble to some degree in that google is gonna want again to answer specific people's question rather than just giving like the broad answer. So more specific content is what you should be thinking about, um, so you can account for this. Mm -hmm. So it it ties into that. We we've got a few questions I think that are relevant to this. So so one question was, um, what could developers do? Like, well, th this is also a, a big thing in in where when working in SEO, right? You you have to to really align with developers and, and make sure everything is great there. Um, but I guess there's the wider context for this is also a question we received about um, what exactly in, in practical terms, what could we do to rank or to improve our rank in SERP? 
So I would say that you should be thinking about, you should be talking to your developers about how, how you handle media. That's what I would, that's what I would say. I've, I've said that I've written this and I wrote an article about, about some of these trends um, uh, at the beginning of the year. And I would say that you should be making sure that you have, you know, a good CDN um, and, and, that, and that you have, um, you know, good media. I mean, the, the, uh, for instance, for instance, um, at my team uh, at Wix, we are have. If you upload an image onto onto Wix, it's already connected to Google's um, Cloud Vision API and gives you information on the tags. Like it generates tags and tells you like what they are. So if, if <laughs> case in point, I have a personal site that's a Wix site. If I upload a picture of me, then it then it says then it says like curly hair. <laughs> for instance, like it says, oh, you know, that's that's what it goes. It goes, that's a lady with curly hair. And I go, yes, that that's true. Um, and so and and so so these are the, this is this is what happened. So 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 some for instance our so our cd our sorry our crm is um uh is is built with that in mind and i think i think more important people are going to be thinking about that there's so there are apis that you can connect to that will allow you to do that so for instance cloud cloud vision api allows you to connect with that they have they have other other different apis that will allow you to, to connect to some of their um their more advanced um um uh, you know uh, systems um directly um, so that's something that if you have like a big, big budget, you can you can look at um, when you're thinking about, um, you know, and when you're thinking about the media that you have on, on your website, making sure that it's highly accessible and that and that that people are able to access it clearly is really good. If you're thinking about um, content for, say, like things like webinars like this. I highly encourage people to make sure that it's successful in many ways. So if you these days, if you go on to uh, onto a like a news article, for instance, they'll often have an audio snippet of it as well. They'll have the audio of it. They'll have the text of it. They'll have mm -hmm. a picture of it. They'll have all of the different ways for people to access it. And this is good not only for algorithms and for how people how the the bots might read it, but it's also good for for different users who have different requirements. Like maybe I don't have time to look at a screen, or maybe I've been looking at a screen all day and I just want to listen to somebody yeah. read me this article. Um, so so you know I think that making sure that you have that your team is able to support lots of different kinds of ways that users might access your site is really, really important. And of course, of course, of course, of course, of course, make sure that it's mobile friendly um, and as mobile friendly as possible because a lot of this is being led by the sort of mobile interactions. Yeah, just to add to that, um, you know, I think that exactly what Crystal is saying is exactly right. And also comes back down to markup. And, you know, like she's saying, uh, describe your pictures better, uh, uh, surface your, your media content more, also wrap that in, uh, uh, transcripts and again marking those things up, giving good structured markup. And I don't, I don't just mean like schema. I mean like you know, write header tags and and put your tables in actual tables rather than divs. Things like that uh, are really valuable. Just make your content easier to extract for Google. Mm -hmm. So, so that also because the we started talking about okay, let's let's give. Um, the people who are watching us now, some practical advice on on how to improve their performance or what does it mean for what they have to do. Uh, but but one of the things I think we're we're facing in SEO anyway uh, for a while, and I, I expect it to become even more, is how do you report on success? Right, a, a a while back it was like you know you would have clients. I'm guessing Mike as well. I'm assuming, <laughs> but uh, and Crystal as well um, coming and saying I want to rank number one for these terms or the terms you tell me uh there would be like tracking of those positions work would be measured on okay we've created content for these keywords with that search volume do you see that changing should people in seo change their approach on how they not just how they do work but how they report on success because of mom I think people need to be need, so so anybody who's working in SEO who doesn't understand how to read their data properly needs to stop and learn how to read their data properly <laughs> because because you like there is no people say oh I want to rank on page 1 of Google I'm like what page which mm -hmm. page where is this page there are many, 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 many pages. Okay, so like I will see a different page than you will see, than my sister will see, than my husband will see. There are many, many different pages, and there, and so I've had it before where I've had clients and and we I, I don't know it was like a I, I use this example a lot. 
it was a marquee client, like party, you know, tents for parties and stuff. And everybody, there's only so many keywords for that. There's like, and everybody's got the same one. And I was like, well, okay, let's see how we go. I looked up this keyword. It was like, how many, how many, what size marquee for a hundred people, right? And, and I looked up and, and everybody had the same picture. They had this beauty shot of a marquee with flowers and like ready for a wedding and da, 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 da. And I was like, that's not the kind of information I want. What I want to know is how many people, if I want a round table, how many people, if I want a banquet table, how many people, if we got a dance floor, how many people, if we don't have anything in there, how many people, if there's a bar, blah, blah, blah. So I got on Canva, made these, all these ugly di diagrams on Canva and I stuck them all on the thing. And do you know what? This, we started ranking on images first. We started ranking on the image search first, and mm -hmm. then we started ranking in, on Google on the on the other part. When you're looking in something like, oh, there's a fun tool I've heard of called SEMrush. Um, <laughs> when you're looking in SEMrush, the, you can you can see whether you're ranking on certain packs. You can see where yep. you're working on local pack. You can see where they're working on image pack. You can see where they're ranking for videos. You can see where you're ranking for all these different things. That is your friend. Um, if you have a if you have a section if you have a piece of content that is ranking somewhere for one con for in the regular part that maybe isn't ranking or isn't ranking for video that's where you should be going if you do, if you're not ranking for video that's where you should be going like have a look have a look at that and and if the SERP is full of videos and images at the front part and you don't have any on there then like you need to get involved like mm -hmm. you just have to um so so I would say that that it's a question of making sure that you're tracking that part of it. So if if the SERP is, if the front of the SERP is all images, like I think I was looking up one for like hedgehogs the other day, don't ask me why. Um, but if you look up a hedgehog, the, the, the whole front of the of the um, the viewport on mobile is, is pictures of hedgehogs. Mm -hmm. Well, ranking number one for hedgehog is no good because you're actually on page two. Mm -hmm. So, the data needs to reflect the SERP. So if the so if the if the query is around images, then your data should be around images for that particular for that particular one. If the query it, it has lots of has lots of text, like let's say we're looking up I don't know tax law, international tax law. I don't think there's that many pictures for that. Um, then you should make make sure that you're looking for for text and understand the data for that. But if you but if you have a multimodal search, then you're going to have to look at that. The other thing I would also say is look at the actual SERP. Don't just rely on on tools, but look at the actual SERP because it's always changing. Google gave. I'm sorry, I'll, Michael, let you speak in just a second. But <laughs> Google Google gave an example at um at one of their recent ones. I think it was Search On about um about what is a lion, right? The and they said, oh, we'll, we'll think about the search. What is a lion? And we want to understand the intent that you don't want to know whether the lion's going to be a pet or whether the lion's going to be this side or the other. And I was watching this and was like, oh, let me Google what is a lion. And I Google what is a lion. Do you know there's now a 3D lion there? There's a 3D lion, like a a like there's a 3D like AR lion. And me and my kid were playing with this lion or whatever. Okay, so that is what that SERP looks like. So if you previously had the SERP for lion, there's now a whole distraction of an AR yeah. lion there. <laughs> but, and and that's what I was thinking while you were saying this, Crystal. Is like historically or traditionally in SEO, you look at the SERPs, you look at tools like SEMrush to get ideas and, and then say, right, this is what Google rewards. This is indica indicative of, of the intent and what I need to create. And I'm going to try and do a bit better and hopefully I'll be then on top. But but what we see and probably, um, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, Mike, as well, with mom, um, we've already seen uh, a lot more volatility uh, in the past year in the SERPs, right? Morty did also a great analysis of that. But we probably should no longer reply on like, okay, here's a SERP. It looks like it wants just a, a blog post, for example. I'll I'll just create a blog post because we expect that to also change as, as this is deployed across more and more searches and, and industries, right? Well, yes and no. Um and it kind of overlaps with the previous question because um, yeah. how are we going to measure this? And what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of this is going to be direct answers. And okay. it's like, you don't necessarily know where you featured in that direct answer. And, um, yeah. you know, Google, same with like voice search, like Google doesn't give us analytics on voice search. So yeah. to that end, and until we're able to get something that's more robust in understanding like what the impacts are, it's really hard to say, right? Um, but I do agree that ultimately you do need to take a look at the SERP and what is ranking yeah. and use that to inform 
what content type you should be targeting because in some cases you know maybe the user actually wants a video and so just do that and then repurpose what is said in that video so you're covering all your bases so i think a lot of this is going to yield more repurposing content and thinking of ways that you can maximize content in a variety of different formats so you're hitting all the buckets around the multimodal search mm -hmm. okay um so I want to talk a bit about now um, specifically some 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 industries we've hit we've seen being impacted a lot from even core updates or other updates being in the in the spotlight of what Google is working on, and we have a question about uh, for you, Crystal, initially, but uh, I, I want both your opinions. How how do you see this impacting um health or medical industry uh mom impacting them specifically the blogs i think the question is about the blog and the content there but i'm guessing it's it's interesting as a wider uh topic like would mom impact these industries more so yes but I'm not sure that it's exactly the same as the wider one. So I mentioned it in my in my deck. And the reason why I mentioned it was because at Google I.O. last year, Google also announced that they were going to be rolling out like a big, a big um, medical uh, dermatological project that was going to be relying on a lot of the same tooling as mum. So the, a lot of image search and a lot of like multimodal, like sort of information and, and that sort of thing. And also having worked with a lot of medical clients, I am very aware that Google is very, is very, very much gatekeeping that content. So um, there are some keywords that you cannot advertise for. There are some key keywords where if you are a commercial medical, medical um, uh, business, you can't rank. They, they basically, they only let like the Mayo Clinic and WebMD and like um, the CDC, they only let them rank. And like in the UK, it's like the NHS and okay. they will not let like, you know, doctor, doctor, so-and-so rank if they don't know who they are. Like this, it's just, it's not worth putting your money in that, in that pot. Like you can do it in a different way. You can go for like long tail, like stuff like that. Um, but I, I would say that, that mom, Mum is it, it, the 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 thing that will change with it is I think that that because Mum is so much more powerful than Bert has so much more under so much better understanding of entities. I think that it will allow it will allow Google to do better better um, jurisprudence or I don't know what it, what you what, or due diligence I guess we should say around EAT. So um, we Mike talked about about entities. Um, and things like knowledge graphs, like so, so knowledge graphs are steadily increasing. They're putting more and more knowledge graphs with things. Um, so, so for instance, if you are if you are an expert in your field, Google will is more likely to be able to identify you as an expert in your field when you're writing about whatever content is related to your medical practice. So, um, so you know, if, if you're Dr. Fauci or something, Google's going to be it's going to be a lot easier for them to understand that you're Dr. Fauci and you actually do know what you're talking about. Um, but don't, let's not get into the politics of that. But, um, but, but, but you know, people will be they'll be able to understand understand that. Um, but the, um, but, but, you know, and I think that, that Google, that Google mom will allow them to do that, to do that more quickly. Um, so it's worth investing time in making sure that, that if you are working in a medical space, that you have, um, that your, your team, the people in your team and your, in your, um, your medical business as a whole has a clear and robust, um, uh, you know, sort of EAT profile. So, you know, I'm thinking that, that, you know, you've got like, if you're working in a medical space, you may very well be written written up in scholarly journals. So you should probably be on Google Scholar. Um, you know, there there's probably other. You're probably working with like charity groups, things like that. Make sure that you're very clear there. Make sure you've got clear bios. Make sure all of your LinkedIn stuff is up to scratch. Any um, you know, any of your certificates, all that sort of things. Make sure that all of that stuff is very clearly um, represented and very clearly clearly very clearly um, accessible. To Google in a lot of different ways. So using schema markup for like profile pages, using um, using uh, schema markup for adding any certificate images like, and logos and verifications and things like that. Because Google, it, I think it will make it easier for Google to verify that you are who you say you are and you know what you're talking about and that people are, that it's worth referring to you. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. yeah, I think in that space, it's, it's very easy for them to just cut everyone else out, like you're yeah. saying, um, because there's so much information that is like, vetted and peer reviewed and and maybe buried in some of these documents but i think when we talk about 
translation, it isn't just like, how do I translate from this language to this language? They may also be able to be like, how do I make this um, accessible to other people that aren't experts? And so to that end, you know, seeing with Google doing all the stuff where they were like writing their own featured snippets and so on for health related topics, I could see them just squeezing everyone else out that isn't the CD, CDC or NHS or uh, Dr. Fauci. <laughs> but this is this is very interesting, actually, for two reasons. So so we also have a question around it ties a bit into search intent and how that can differ from one language to another. So it's not just about translating content. There's there's a huge angle to that, which is about actually is intent even similar in, in some cultures and, and contexts. But um, for example, like it, yeah, I was just thinking like if I if I googled how do I fix a boot in in uh, in England, <laughs> nice. It would be the the end of your car, like the back of your car. If you were like, how do I fix a boot in America? I'm <laughs> talking about you know your Timberlands or whatever, and then it, then you know, um, <laughs> or how do I fix a trunk? It's completely different yeah. as well. Or what time should I turn up? <laughs> <laughs> And even even in the even in the health industry, right? Sometimes I'm, you know, I'm I'm also in the UK and I see results from from WebMD, for example, or from from US websites, and I don't get an answer whether kind of like that medication, for example, is is supplied by the NHS. So I'm wondering why am I seeing US results uh, when when I'm in the UK? So it. it it can also kind of um, involve some complications. I think they're testing a lot of stuff. There was recently an example about cars from Australia, about yellow cars from Australia that somebody shared on Twitter as well, that someone was looking for yellow cars and they were like, why are you showing me things from Australia? And Google's like, my bad, we're, we'll fix that, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <Sauce>. Yeah, <laughs> um, But But we're already, because Google has kind of, Set the expectations. They they will be letting us know as they go along and how mum is is affecting SERPs. But uh, for example, a couple of days ago, they they said that they're starting to use or they're going to roll it out in the next few weeks. I think how to use mum to to provide better results when you're in a situation you know that that it involves kind of like a crisis or a risk to your life, like you know substance abuse or um they had a few examples like you know uh domestic violence for example right and because i saw that and i was very curious i was kind of like starting to do what i see now right so if i and, and that is part of mom trying to guess that intent so if i search for uh domestic abuse i get the helpline and then i get like what it is the, the kind of usual informational content and what to do about it but if i search um i have to apologize publicly to my husband i'm afraid of my husband uh <laughs> I, I just see other women posting in forums about their, their kind of stories, right? So, uh, Mike, what do you see the, the, the importance of placing much more effort on our side as content creators, SEOs, in covering intent and understanding that intent ourselves versus like, oh, is there a keyword with a search volume that I can see for this? Yeah. Um, I mean... Again, I don't. I don't think much needs to change. Like if you've been doing it right, <laughs> uh, you shouldn't really have a problem. And so I think in this case, we were talking about like crises and things like that. One, you got to think hard. Like, is this a place where your brand should be? Because what Google is saying is perhaps these brands shouldn't be here. It shouldn't be some you know 750 word blog post written by some random copywriter on a subject that they don't know anything about. That they just like Googled and rewrote some stuff. Like that shouldn't be the case. It should be an actual authoritative, trustworthy um, site whose information is appearing there. And so I think this level of filtering that Mum brings is actually fantastic because you know there's a lot of times where the where i've been in a situation like medical situation and i'm reading through something and i'm like yeah some seo copywriter wrote this don't trust this one like, yeah keep going. <laughs> and so i think i think this approach that they're taking is is ultimately going to make the experience in the world a better place because we are so reliant on google mm. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think, I think that there's, if you really want to see it, like there's, there's a quite a lot of screenshots and stuff like from, from during like, like the peak COVID times, I guess you would say, that's kind of been a trial run for all of this. So, so, you know, in the UK, there was a lot of, like, if you look up 
um, again, I'm getting into spicy territory, but if you look up like COVID vaccinations, you don't get like, you know, people discussing COVID vac vaccinations, you get vaccination centers and they're by the NHS and it's like all of that, that sort of information. And they were gatekeeping that there was a point at what, which were like, they weren't doing advertisements for masks and they would only put, um, they would only put like, this is what a mask is like, and like information where they're, where they're sort of driving, driving people to that. And I think some of, some of those are being led by partnerships. Um, so, so direct partnerships with, 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 um, within the SERP. Um, and that's not necessarily, I, I don't think that's necessarily a direct, um, response, response to mom, but I think that, that, um, that, that, I mean, the COVID, the COVID one, I think is, is an example of pulling through lots, lots of information. Um, but I, but I think that it is, it is an example of Google, Google being more confident in creating the content themselves. Um, which is sort of what what Mike's been Mike's been talking about. Like they're they're happy to like be like we have the answers. Like we will supply you the answers using pulling from different places across the web. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so on one hand, I'm kind of devastated because we have a lot of interesting questions and uh, <laughs> we're running out of time to cover them. But uh, if it's okay with you, Mike and Crystal, I want to encourage uh, people to to ask those questions and reach out to us on Twitter or, or LinkedIn, and, and we're more than happy to to answer those questions yeah. as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I just keep yeah. a list of them. Maybe I'll just do like a blog post. Maybe Crystal yeah, and we, I can do a blog post. We can cause... do a blog post, we'll do a collab, we'll <laughs> do the whole thing. Let's yeah. do, let's do that, because there, there are some amazing questions here um, that, that it would be great to get answers for. Um, but if if I ask you uh, each of you to wrap up this conversation, um, I think what would be useful um would be to to so if it was you tomorrow and you're running seo uh for for a business pretty much close to the situation you're in but what would you what would be the first thing you take care of as of tomorrow to be prepared for this if you haven't already no you no you crystal, crystal okay. you. All right, i'm gonna go thank you thank you erica um <laughs> Um, I would, I've said, I've said it many times, but I, I would um, do a, a media audit of anything, of anything that we, that we are ranking for um, that currently doesn't have a decent multimedia on it. Um, not everything has to be a video um, and it can be tricky if you've got things that are, that like, if you've got a, a fairly dry subject, like something like, I don't know, like, I don't know, like I said, tax law or something like that. But you know, there are tools, Canva is a free, it, it can, is free to use and you can make, you can make yourself like, you know, um, uh, infographics, for instance, that are really useful. And I've, I've done this with clients who had a really boring topic, less of, um, and, and, you know, we doubled, we doubled their image visibility, um, uh, using, using this. Um, so, so I would say anything where you don't have, where you don't have multimedia, get involved with multimedia. Um, and if you can, if you can add, another layer of multimedia to that I would I would do that as well obviously keep it classy like don't bombard people with like with like a million pop-ups and like things mm -hmm. every, everywhere um but but make sure that that you know you are satisfying the um the media requirements that are being reflected on the SERP for your queries so you would do kind of like a media content audit uh to see if you satisfy that intent with what you have already um perfect with, with what you have that's already uh, that's already ranking ranking okay Mike, what would you do tomorrow? I would align my keywords with the target audiences and then see how uh, their needs are different because different personas searching for the same keyword may need different things. And then see uh, how well our content aligns with that. So again, another content audit, but more aligned with the keyword versus the audience. And then fill in the blanks around what those questions they might have might be and try to answer those in more comprehensive ways again through different types of content through imagery through videos yeah. uh and so on so that we can we can basically check the boxes across the different modes for how users might search so that we have more opportunity yeah. to potentially rank yeah. uh in the way that google is thinking now mm -hmm. great so um, I know we've we've run over a bit. Thank you all for your patience and thank you for your time. Uh, it was it was great talking with you today. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it. Please reach out to us on social, uh, and we hope to take the conversation there uh, from here. Take care, everyone. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thanks for having me. Later. Bye.